So in this talk, I will try and um, uh, address the several uh, field of research have been developing over the last uh, at least four years, maybe a bit more, uh, especially in connection to my current project called uh, Cogito in Space. Uh, the project has been developed at the Dwingelo Radio Telescope, which is the uh, facilities you see here in, uh, in the picture. It's a radio telescope um, uh, currently used only for, um, well, not only, but mostly for outreach. Uh, Amateur radio technologies, it's uh, not in use for scientific uh, purposes anymore. And um, I've been artist in residence at the telescope since 2009, and I've been working on a series of projects, mostly uh, very experimental. And um, initially, my, um, let's say, uh, discovery of uh, radio astronomy uh, was uh, through the uh, moon bounce technology, which I'm sure you are, most of you are familiar with. Um, and uh, I developed together with a team of radio operators uh, at the radio telescope a way to visualize the data uh, transmitted using the, the technology. Um, so in a way, um, challenging a little bit the historical use that uh, the, the technology was created for, which was originally to send and receive mail voice uh, from one radio station to another radio station using the moon as a natural uh, satellite. So I was especially interested in the possibility of people uh, engaging in a live performance during which we will be able to uh, send and receive images uh, reflected by the moon's surface. And so this is how I started working with uh, uh, radio astronomers and uh, also playing around with the radio, uh, with the electromagnetic spectrum using uh, radio waves as light waves. And especially, I think in the process, uh, I especially um, appreciated the possibility to engage with the, with the audience and uh, really um, understand what kind of images that they were interested in sending for a, a cosmic journey, which was probably for them once uh, in a lifetime event. So um, this somehow brought me closer to the idea of what could be, for example, uh, the collective consciousness of uh, this kind of global um, uh, citizenship in, 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 in uh, engaging all of a sudden in a sort of democratized uh, space travel. And um, so the, one of the performances in which I employ this technology is called Optics. Uh, the title, of course, borrowed from uh, Newton's essay on uh, light uh, reflection and refraction. And um, I present this performance regularly once a year as part of Global Astronomy Month and uh, so we collect images from around the world, including this one which was all, uh, left on the moon surface in 1972 by uh, astronaut uh, Charles Duke, who uh, sent me an image uh, two years ago for uh, one of these live performances and uh, um, the scanned copy of the, of the same image that we um, sent to the moon and back. So this is just actually as a framework for my current project. And um, as I said, um, this really uh, brought me to explore this idea of uh, what, are, uh, what is the connection between the mind and the cosmos. Um, so for me, these images are somehow visualized uh, thoughts. And uh, also I appreciated the fact that um, through this performance, we engage in a sort of interstellar, well, a sort of interplanetary transmission of images, which is usually only um, a technology used by radio astronomers for uh, connecting uh, with the space probe uh, through the deep space network. And um, together with this work also, uh, I was, uh, I've been uh, working alongside uh, radio astronomers. And uh, I came across to, I, I was especially engaged in looking at, more in depth at this kind of image, such as this one, which was taken in 2013, uh, when the very first uh, hole on the Martian surface was uh, drilled by, I think, Curiosity rover. And what really uh, st struck me about this, this image in particular is the incredible connection 
um, sensorial connection, let's say, between uh, the viewer, and uh, I will speak about myself, myself and the image. So I, I, um, I really, I think this image for me was kind of like iconic in the sense that really made me connect with the landscape that I was viewing. So there is this incredible uh, perfect hole in the Martian surface, which almost looks like a piece of um, uh, land art. And also the texture, the color of the environment is so greatly detailed and realistic. And yet my mind has to step back and uh, actually remind me that this is a uh, landscape uh, which we still have to understand. Uh, it is not uh, the, the chemistry, the texture, it is something which we haven't experienced yet. We will never maybe be able to experience it. So um, this led me to explore in greater depth this uh, dichotomy, let's say, between uh, the mind and uh, sensorial per perception, the, the, the body experience in uh, most uh, in contemporary cosmology. So we are uh, surrounded on a daily basis by images of cosmic phenomena, of um, uh, places, planets, uh, exoplanets, and, uh, and others, uh, things which we will never be able to experience directly. And yet we look at them as if they are a perfect image of reality. Uh, so the project uh, I'm... Uh, I've already uh, opened a few months ago uh, to the public. It's uh, called Cogito in Space, as I mentioned earlier, and um, also links back to the tradition of the golden records in a way. Uh, as you probably know, there is one minute recording in the golden records of uh, Carl Sagan's wife, uh, brain, brain activity. So uh, this is Anne Droyan's uh, brain activity uh, of one hour compressed into a one minute recording, which is uh, been encrypted in the, the golden records. And this, this uh, recording was done with the old fashioned technology of uh, uh, ink needles on paper. And apparently, uh, the neuroscientist I'm collaborating with um, detected a lot of uh, uh, technical problems with the recording. But however, the concept, of course, is uh, what uh, I find the most interesting. And uh, science fiction has been tackling the issue of uh, connecting the mind and uh, cosmos in uh, several uh, masterpieces like uh, Stanislav Lem's Solaris. Uh, in which he also explores the possibility of communicating with a sentient planet um, uh, using an EEG uh, recording. And uh, in particular, the novel, I think, is very interesting in the sense that uh, Solaris is a philosophical exploration of human anthropo anthropomorphic limitations. So I was especially interested in, uh, in this uh, aspect of some uh, great science fiction I've been reading um, in the last few years. And of course, the film adaptation uh, takes uh, part of the, of the narrative from the novel, uh, but it goes, in my opinion, a bit further. So in um, Tarkovsky's film, this is how the planet of the, 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 the surface of the planet Solaris is visualized. Uh, so it is a sort of, um, uh, yeah, it is an oceanic uh, surface. Uh, with uh, this matter, which of unknown uh, somehow substance, which cannot be streamed in any way, so uh, it really reminds me of the thought process, especially of the flow of consciousness that has been explored so greatly in uh, some uh, 20th century literature. Um, so the, the flux of consciousness, the, what, what we also call spontaneous cognition. I was especially interested in that, in capturing that in, in this work. So in, um, in uh, um, the, 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 also the, the film, I think, uh, tackles what uh, is really at the center of my uh, exploration, which is the exploration of the unreliability of reality and the power of the human unconscious, a great examination of the limits of rationalism, according to Salman um, Rushdie. So the project is uh, based at the Dwingelo radio telescope. So the, the reason installation inside uh, the cabin that you see pictured here. And um, for now, the, the, the project exists as a mobile installation. So we've been presenting it at several uh, conferences and um, also exhibitions. 
and eventually it will settle at the radio telescope in the spring 2018. And uh, people will be able to um, enter the cabin, one person at a time will enter the cabin and will, um, um, a neuroscientist will prepare the subject with an EEG uh, device, an electroencephalogram cap, cap and uh, the virtual reality headset. So the, the aim of the project is to record the brain activity while people view this uh, video, a 10 minutes uh, long film uh, created for the project and uh, the spontaneous cognition, let's say, emerging, emerging from the visualization of this film will be uh, recorded and uh, uh, converted into sound and uh, transmitted into space um, as radio waves in uh, pretty much real time with a very short, uh, very few seconds delay. Uh, so I'm very grateful to my collaborators. This project uh, is a combination of several technologies that uh, I had to develop, of course, with uh, also uh, very skilled uh, technicians and scientists. And uh, the scientists I work with, uh, Stephen Whitmarsh, uh, Guillaume Dumas and uh, Robert Ossenveld, found really interesting the challenges uh, brought by the project in the sense that, uh, first of all, they never worked in a uh, conversion in real time of uh, EEG data, and uh, furthermore, in the transmission of those data into, uh, in, in conversion of the data into radio waves. So um, for them, it was really a question of developing a bit further the open source uh, software they are already uh, working on for other uh, art projects. Um, so this is the, the setup of the project, the, ins the in inside of the cabin. And uh, these are some images from the work in progress. Uh, so the, the preparation of the subject will be conducted by one of the neuroscientists. So it will be a, it is a sort of performative uh, event as well, and hopefully an experiential uh, moment as well for for the person who uh, who is prepared. So we use a, a sophisticated uh, brain cap that uh, has 32 channels. And uh, the, the aim for that is because I wanted the project to be quite uh, accurate from the scientific point of view. So I was really interested in uh, the brain activity as a real matter, as a real material of the project. So that's the reason for uh, looking for a professional collaboration. And um, so the, um, yeah, the, this is the final setup with the with the Oculus. We chose the Oculus because it's a less, less bulky than the HTV and also um, more lightweight and um, therefore won't obstruct uh, most of the uh, electrodes. Okay, so um, the neuroscientists have been uh, looking especially uh, for this challenge. And so, of course, the, my request was to uh, record the brain activity in real time and also uh, create a recording the entire brain, brain activity. Usually when neuroscientists uh, conduct their research in a lab, they will be looking at one particular part of the brain and will be focusing on that particular um, element, for example, visual uh, inputs or, or, or others. Uh, in my case, I really wanted to uh, record uh, as much as possible the specialization special thoughts, let's say, and uh, to uh, convert that into radio waves with a minimal loss of data. Um, so, of course, there is also some uh, SAIT involved, some search for extraterrestrial intelligence. Eventually, uh, that is not the aim, main uh, objective of the project, but uh, we uh, assume there will be a potential listener who will be able, therefore, to uh, understand the complex um, spontaneous spontaneous cognition of our, of our brain and especially the very controversial nature of our thinking process, which is not usually what uh, SETI has been addressing so far, quite, quite the opposite. There are, of course, some practical constraints, uh, portability, uh, the limited uh, um, uh, capacity of the location where we work at and, uh, and others. Also, the conversion of these 32 channels into one uh, audio uh, track, which is the 
uh, the track we convert into radio waves. So here are some images from the virtual reality film that we created uh, in collaboration with uh, Sandro Bocci. Sandro has been recording uh, fluids and objects um, in a very analog way, let's say. So it's not really virtual reality per se. We didn't want to have uh, CGI images or uh, we really wanted to have a very uh, central um, uh, experience of, of the film. And uh, so the, the, the narrative um, uh, is, takes somehow the viewer from the Big Bang to the formation of uh, galaxies, planets, down to the experience of the sight of the Earth uh, seen from space. This is, the, of course, the, uh, one of the most uh, shared images, I think, nowadays. And I was interested in uh, this kind of view because I think uh, it is an image that uh, we are exposed um, at so often uh, that somehow uh, I was interested in how this image becomes eventually a subjective image. So how do we appropriate individually uh, this image? Uh, so is there such a thing as a scientific image that our mind doesn't quite appropriate and doesn't turn into a subjective interpretation? Um, so the, 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 the research also was, is, has been crossed by other fields, which I will briefly mention, like the overview effect, which is a research field by, uh, conducted by Frank White, um, who is uh, informally supervising the project. And uh, Frank White is especially interested in uh, looking at the cognitive shift that uh, has been recorded in most astronauts that had the opportunity to uh, uh, experience directly the sight, uh, the sight of the Earth uh, seen from space. Apparently, uh, the astronauts uh, all report uh, something which uh, other citizens can't quite uh, grasp yet, uh, which is this um, radical cognitive shift for which uh, the, they understand the continuity, the, the interconnectedness of all uh, geographical and uh, social uh, phenomena on, on our planet. And this is something perhaps that we are, uh, some of us at least, understand intellectually, but um, I think the experience, the difference of the direct experience seems, seems to bring the re this really long-lasting and radical uh, change in the mind of the astronauts. And uh, also, um, the way I'm, uh, I'm using virtual reality is somehow a little bit speculative in the sense that I'm not so interested in the, in the technology per se. What I find fascinating is the proximity of the image to the retina. So, um, and to me, the proximity of the images uh, to the eyes is a, a, a way to bring the uh, so-called reality as close as possible to the mind. So it creates, in my opinion, this interesting contrast between what is reality, what we are actually seeing and uh, how our mind somehow makes sense of it. And you might recognize this image from uh, Wim Wenders' film, uh, Until the End of the, of the World, where perhaps uh, he formalized this um, idea of MRI scan, so the possibility of viewing through the mind uh, reality. Uh, so it's a little bit the opposite of what happens in virtual reality, but I think it is somehow uh, connected to the way I am looking at it. So uh, more about the mind projected onto the, onto the VR headset than the other way around. And this is uh, an image from the film. Uh, here are some slides of the work in progress. Uh, the work in progress has been quite experiential so far in the sense that we have to spend some uh, several days uh, in the facilities next to the radio telescope. Uh, so a lot of conversations really arise from our uh, interdisciplinary team, let's say, and that has somehow brought uh, some much more insight in, into the project than and I would uh, initially expect. Um, so uh, I will briefly go through some of the uh, theories that's also intertwined with the project. Um, you might be familiar with uh, Mind and Cosmos by Thomas Nagel, which uh, I think is a book that uh, mostly uh, has, been has been 
providing material for my research and this project. And it's about the tension between the mind and, and, the, and the cosmos. So how can we understand uh, a bigger reality if we don't yet understand our own mind and whether we will be able to understand it? Uh, that is obviously an open question. So isn't it sufficient to try to understand ourselves from within, which is hard enough? Yet, uh, the ambition appears to be irresistible, as if we cannot legitimately proceed in life just from the point of view that we naturally occupy in the world, but must encompass ourselves in a larger worldview. And to succeed, that larger worldview must encompass itself. So I think it's a very well-phrased um, explanation of the um, paradox, really, that we face every time we um, somehow address uh, cosmology. And also uh, neuroscientist David uh, Eagleman, uh, reference to that, saying our perception of reality has less to do with what's happening out there and more to do with what's happening inside our brain. And just to close, uh, I, I'm just going to mention this because I think it might be interesting to some of you as well. Um, taking this idea of the uh, mind and cosmos to the extreme, I mean to the extreme of philosophical debate I'm aware of, um, uh, the weak anthropic principle, which is very much used in uh, SETI, um, states that we must be prepared to take account of the fact that our location in time and space in the universe is necessarily privileged to the extent of being compatible with, with our existence as observers. So, uh, is the universe uh, this somehow, uh, there, there is this mirroring effect um, between the, the, the universe and the mind according to the weak anthropic uh, principle, and that, of course, um, it's a, a very a, a broad philosophical question. So that's the project uh, website. Uh, thank you so much. Are there any questions on this project? Yes, please. Will the cognition embody and not appear in mind? Cognition is more of the body. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, uh, but I think uh, this is really um, about the notion of. Um, I think it's more about the, the notion of the universe. Um, <clears throat> I really, I mean, this research really uh, questions that. It's not, I'm not uh, trying to, um, you know, a kind of a, uh, be a promoter of Cartesian philosophy in any way, but uh, I think that uh, for me, these images um, uh, for sure create this dichotomy. So uh, this is what I'm questioning through this work. And, uh, and often people say, oh, why do you send your brainwaves into space? Uh, again, this is not like a question that I'm uh, trying to answer. It is, I think, more about the individual interpretation of, uh, of the experience. Uh, and so I think it's more about uh, perhaps, um, yeah, like reviving this discourse rather than siding with, um, you know, the uh, traditional philosophy of mind or... But I wanted to accentuate that. So, in fact, uh, we expect people to be still while they watch the video. So there is no real recording, for example, of heartbeat or... Um, so it is very much about the mind being, being, being uh, the only subject of, um, uh, of perception, yeah. Thank you. Thank you.